A look inside the branding of the massive sports industry, next on Carpe Diem. Hello and welcome to Carpe Diem. I'm Mark Rosenwig, Associate Professor in the School of Communication and Media at Montclair State University. The growth of professional and college sports makes effective branding of sports properties more critical than ever. I discuss the branding of sports with a panel of three sports media professionals at the Yogi Berra Museum and Learning Center. The panel included Pat Capra, President of Lunar Sports Group, Matthew Futterman, Senior Sports Writer for the Wall Street Journal, and Jessica Slanker. Director of Marketing and Media Partnerships for the New York Giants. In part two of our discussion, I asked Jessica Slanker about the use of social media to market sports properties. It's fascinating, to say the least. Uh, Giant, the Giants were probably one of the later teams to get into the space. We have almost four million followers on Facebook, right? A million on Instagram, Twitter, everywhere else. Uh, to an earlier point, a way to get access to the team and the players back in the day was to go through the team. Now you have 53 men on your roster, 53 individual social media accounts who can put out their own info, promote their own sponsors. Uh, it's been a fascinating role back on the sponsorship side as well as just the team branding side. But we have, uh, we've really, we've hit the ground running. So I'd say the, the majority of our new hires have all been in that space. So whether it's content creation, production side, social media side, graphic side, uh, we have a full in-house team that is working 24 hours a day, especially this time of year between combine, draft, free agency, it's around the clock and that's what fans expect. So that's where we need to be. And that's where there are some opportunities for our students for the future, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, knowing yeah. that landscape is, it's a critical now to understanding and also, on my side, selling sports. You, to be able to sell that package and create that content and put that out as a unified Giants presentation, uh, it, it's a very critical piece to, in my opinion, to understanding the business landscape. So the, yes, the more you're able to delve into uh, being a player on social media, understanding the business side of it, the branding side of it, the strategy behind it. Every team, Giants, especially in this market, uh, biggest media market in the world, we have to have a unified strategy behind what we put out across all of our channels. And social now is at the top of that strategy. Now for the Giants, does that mean linking a lot of sponsors to certain mm -hmm. social media messages and yes. so on? Is that part of your initiative? For sure. Yeah. Uh, I think it's probably been flipped on its head in terms of sponsorship models, but almost every sponsor now starting our conversation with what can we do on mobile, what can we do on social, what can we do on digital, what thematic packages can we put out across all of those platforms. The, the rule we have at the Giants is it's always football first. So we are never going to put out a straight advertisement. Uh, we are never going to throw a logo up there for something that doesn't make sense. It has to be, again, to the earlier point, authentic. It has to be about football. And we do that because that's what helps the, the sponsor or the partner. Throwing a logo up there, it's great. You're gonna get a couple million impressions every post, but at the end of the day, what are you truly, what, what's your goal, right? If that goal is to more closely attach to the Giants team, the Giants organization, the Giants fans, every partner wants then to have an authentic role in that, uh, but always football first. And it's worked so far. We've had some really good activations some great viral hits. Uh, the players have done a great job. Can you share one of those viral hits with us? And uh, what, uh... Sure, so we've done now probably four or five years the Rookie Halloween Contest. So we have a partner in Party City, which is a great physical and online retailer. Uh, the partnership started years ago, more around promoting tailgating and some of their peak times a year, which then turned into wait a second, we're in Halloween season. We have a whole new rookie class coming in. We do a great charity event at Hackensack University Medical Center every year. 
uh, for their pediatrics department. Where, how can we tie this all together? And we got fans voting on what costumes the rookies have to wear. The veterans go to the party city locations in the area, start picking out some of the costumes. A lot of grunting and moaning from the rookies. And then one big happy family shows up at the hospital, capture all that back, put that out online. And it's, it's uh, continued to grow every year. And that's just one of many, but it's a great, I think a good intersection of authentic team, authentic sponsor, uh, great player integration. And that's, uh, the, you get content not only on social, the, the, also the, the videos I saw online, <laughs> yeah. giants.com, the players shopping and, you know, having a couple minute video of them yes. in the store and picking out different, you know, things as well, which is also from the player standpoint, that's fun because they get to showcase their personality as well. And mm -hmm. also the interaction with the team. And that's really why, Giants fans would follow the Giants account as they want to know the behind the scenes or what's going on there. You know, like I said, there's, you know, if they need to find out who's signing somewhere else, there's plenty of different opportunities there, but you follow the Giants account. And if, you know, sponsors and brands are, they're smart too. They understand that fans don't want to just have their logo stamped on the right. Giants news feed. That's going to turn them off to the brand as well. And so, you know, people that understand how to best market through social um, understand that something more natural where you have the players and, and Party City and Halloween, that makes great because it's also very fun. And so it's, it's a little bit more subtle of having the brand integrated into that content. Now take us a little bit on the inside with your athletes that you represent. What do you tell them about their use of social media? How do you work with them to develop their unique brand through, through that communication? It, there's always that fine line of the more you say, you know, the more you talk, the more opportunity it is to, you know, say the wrong thing and everything. But the idea is that if you want to create additional opportunities, revenue generating opportunities off the field for yourself, it's going to be very important to have um, robust social media activity. And so um, some players really have no interest in it whatsoever, and they'll pass on the additional opportunities that come to avoid the hassle of constantly you know, being on, needing to updating it. Some people will want to hire out to have someone you know, posting for them. Um, although I think more times than not, eventually um, fans can really kind of see through that. Um, and then that becomes very transparent. And I think that you know, turns people off as well. And so um, then you have other people who are great at it. And you know, the McCordys are a fantastic example of that. You know, they're super active um, and engaging with fans, having two-way conversations and responding to people. Mohamed Sanu, um, with the, um, who just signed with the Falcons, is another Rutgers guy who's uh, fantastic with interacting with his fans and providing a lot of content and insight to his life. So um, I think it's a huge opportunity for you. And if you're interested, um, every company and brand out there is going to look at, you know, the first thing they're going to say is, you know, what are you doing on social? And now you're also able to break down that audience. So someone might have, you know, a million followers, but fig trying to figure out, okay, this percentage is male, this percentage is female, you know, 40% of their audience is in the East Coast. And so companies will go in and they'll want to know that data. Like, what are the metrics of, okay, I'm getting a person, I'm getting this athlete with a million followers but what are the demographics of their audience and, and where are they located? Because they want to market to that specific segment. So now not only just having, you know, a number of followers, but what the demographics of those are becomes important as well. So it's a selling point for potential endorsements. Absolutely, 100%. You're trying to establish who this player is, right, publicly, who, you know, for football specifically, who is this player besides a safety for Team X or a wide receiver for Team Y? You know, who is that person? Or what are they all about? And this is a perfect opportunity to let the public know and interact with the public of who they are. And the more that you can, you know, really work backwards. When we think about trying to identify endorsement opportunities, we try to think about what are the companies that you're using day to day? What are the products that you're using day to day? More natural fit. Um, and so social media should be the same way. Don't try and portray uh, something that you're not. It's just really a window into who you are and then you'll more align yourself with the brands that are attracted uh, to that athlete and who you are, you know, naturally. Just, Matt, yeah, go ahead. Just something to jump in on yeah. that. The, same thing with the players all having their own accounts, right, and doing so much on their accounts. We used to try and consolidate all of that into Giants.com and it got to the point where we're saying, okay, Victor Cruz is front row at this fashion show or Odell is at this shoot there's a fine line, as all of us know, between that sports reporting, that, that news, and then the lifestyle. 
And so the Giants decided last year to launch a dedicated lifestyle site so that we can curate all of the content from all the players' social media feeds and have that live and breathe on its own lifestyle site. So it's not in competition. Again, it's complementing that hard football news with the behind the scenes uh, creative pieces the fans want to see. It also, I'd imagine, brings a lot of maybe more stress into, into your <laughs> world from a sponsorship standpoint yeah. because you know one of the things that was always kind of understood is that if you represent this player that you communicate with the team first about an endorsement that you might have so you know each team the NFL might have a specific car sponsor and so in that category if a you know a, a company uh, approaches you about doing an endorsement deal with your player you'll communicate with the team first to let them know hey we would like to do a, a, a deal in this category right here but we understand that you're you know, aligned with this company. Is there something we can do to align with you as well? If not, we give the you know, right of first refusal in good faith, you let them know, and then you can pursue this. Well, now with social media, like I said, you have 53 different players that you're worried about in baseball, 25, and et cetera, on down the line. You have all these people with their individual accounts, and a lot of times, companies now are using social to cut through the larger endorsement opportunities with the leagues and, and, and the teams or even the players association right they'll just go to some individual players to try and leverage their audience to you know use that as just a, a endorsement through social media right and so now a lot you're cre yeah, a lot a lot <laughs> cheaper so now you're you're having a lot more people dive into that yes. space and i would imagine from a league yes. and a franchise standpoint now you're not only competing with this car company that wanted to do this, there's companies you've never even heard of in categories that didn't even exist five years ago now that are delving into this space. I can imagine it being a lot more complicated. Yeah. Your job is to protect the brand every single day. And it's it's probably a constant exercise where I'm calling our, <clears throat> excuse me, our general counsel saying, here's another rogue marketing ad or here's Giants yeah. Marks putting all over. But it goes back to the education piece internally with the players. So. Um, just helping everybody understand that you can use marks here, but you can't use marks here. Uh, sometimes it's a hard message to send, but yes, because... Can they wear a, I mean, if they pee, can they wear a giant sweatshirt? Uh, technically, so it depends who the sponsor always, is. When we were growing up, there was always like the deodorant commercial. Yes. Where the, <laughs> where the, where the, yeah. right, right, the cut-off tank top yeah. with right. no marks. Right, exactly. Um, so so cool. it's a great question, and it's a constant battle of protecting the brand, depending who the sponsor is, what the category is, what the team exclusivity is, what the player's deal is. There are so many iterations now of the conversation, uh, but one of the, probably the most important piece we hold are trademarks so it is educating the players saying you can't go put your juice or soda or whatever it is next to the Giants mark in the locker room take a picture and put it out to your five million followers wish you could because it would make your life a lot easier and make that sponsor very successful but there's there's rules and those rules come from the NFL they also come from the team so yeah, it's definitely added a couple layers of... Uh, yeah. <laughs> and also, once it's out there, it's gone, right? It's, and so it's, you know... You can tell them to take it down, but once it... Forgiveness yeah. later, but at the same time, once yeah. it's out there, it's already been seen by everybody to delete yes. something that they posted two days ago that at that point, no one's really going to see it, mm -hmm. you know, can be, you know, uh, uh, an issue. And so you just try to keep as open of a communication as possible. And the same thing, you don't want to do anything that's going to be detrimental to the player and their relationship you know, yeah. with the team as well. It's also a positive though too because the players are able to now again do deals in somewhat unconventional categories or with new companies and it's a two-way street where then I can say to them this is awesome you know however you did this deal whoever did it whatever the deal points are it's a great deal in a category we don't have uh, let's talk about it let's see if there's a way to bring the team into it and make it uh, a heightened effect team relationship so both ways. Matt, as a journalist, what is your take on this social media activity, pluses and minuses? Well, it, I mean, the minuses is that, you know, every time I go on Twitter, I'm four keystrokes away from my career being over. <laughs> I mean, it's... The, what are you sending out? Uh, right, well, very honestly, very little. I, right. it, it was, from the time Twitter started, I'm going to sound, you know, 76 years old at this point, but I, I, my immediate reaction was, oh, well, this is going to end a hundred careers because people are going to say stupid yeah, things on it and not be able to take them back. And um, I would say, so rule number one for me is, is you know, almost say as little as possible. I and mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not a huge self-promoter. Um, I don't like, 
you know, I don't, I don't like yelling at people on social media, so I don't really participate in that. If I write a story, I tweet it out and make sure however many followers I have um, know about it. Uh, I'll occasionally say something about another story that I've read that I think is great, but that's about it. I don't use every once in a while, I'll, you know, if there's a, I don't know, if one of my kids meets a, one of the members of the women's national soccer team, I'll take a picture of her with her and, you know, tweet it out or something like that. So you're no, but, Kanye, you're no Kanye West? On no, the, on no, the no, not at all. It's just not, it's, it's just sort of, I just didn't get raised and don't really enjoy living in a 140 character yeah. world. Unfortunately, I do. Um, interestingly enough, a lot of it, it's, it's, Twitter's gotten a lot of attention about their 10th anniversary. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'm not, it's been interesting to watch how, um, I think there's been a real decline in it. Uh, certainly from, from the purposes of news organizations, I think every news organization will tell you that so much more of their traffic and attention comes through Facebook now. Um, I mean, it might be as much as 10 to one in terms of the ratio, so I think there's been, uh, there's been a real change in sort of how people are using Twitter and if they're using Twitter and um, it's, 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 it's been a quickly changing landscape. Uh, I'm kind of hoping that um, the 140 character world will be gone in a few years and I can, go back, to, it I can go back to everything else. So you're, else you're a Facebook doing. fan or no? I mean, a Facebook fan, I'll use it. I'm not on it a lot. I'm, I'm a fan of it in terms of it seems to generate a tremendous, tremendous amount of traffic and attention to things that I write, the Wall Street Journal writes, everyone writes. It seems to, it seems to be, if you get back to that thing we were talking about um, in the last segment about you know, getting to fans where they are, it seems to be where people are right now. Um, that seems to be where people, if you want to reach people, that mm -hmm. seems to be the main mode. And Jessica could probably talk about I was just going to ask you, is, is that your about, experience about too? That how the giants are connected yeah. to people and what kind of results you see. Sure. So, well, interesting, taking a step back, I was out at uh, Google and Twitter in October, and here I am presenting at Twitter thinking I'm presenting about Twitter. And then I get up there and they ask me to present on Periscope. And so to your point about students, being able to master the landscape, it's constantly changing. So those are sellable assets when you walk into an interview or you walk into a team, a league, whatever the industry is, being on top of what's coming, on top of what's changing, knowing how to use it, again, sellable assets back to companies uh, in the space. So there I am up on stage saying, I don't even have the Periscope app downloaded on my phone. I'm about to give a presentation on it. I thought I, I, thought I was. Yeah. Uh, at the forefront of the conversation. Uh, but yeah, the, I mean, the Giants specifically, it's huge. I mean, it's, a, it's everything we do is put out Twitter, Facebook, uh, .com, Lifestyle, like I said, now YouTube. The NFL just allowed uh, the teams to open up YouTube channels, which I didn't think was coming as soon as it did, but the traffic is going there, so we might as well uh, be there, put out, be able to put out our own content and capitalize on it. But the space is changing so quickly. So to be able to master, I don't know if, it, I shouldn't say master. I don't know if any of us are ever going to master it. Uh, but to be able to walk into some of these companies and say, I'd be a great asset because I would be able to leverage your brand on all these channels and understand how they work uh, and how to strategize, I think is a, a very important selling point nowadays. Good advice. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Matt, you have a book coming out soon players. He's not a self-promoter, so he's not. <laughs> no, I'm, 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 for him. I'm twisting his <laughs> arms. I'm forcing him to uh, discuss it. Just give us a little snapshot of your approach, what it's about, and, and what we can learn from it about this, this business. Well, the approach uh, was essentially um, to try and write the definitive book about the creation of the modern sports world. And uh, to do it in about 300 pages, uh, wow. because the last wow. thing I wanted to well, do. This is part one. Right. right the la well, the last. more than anthology. 140 characters. Yeah. But the right. <laughs> but the last wow. thing I wanted to do was was for this book to feel like your vegetables. Um, you know, I wanted it to be something that you wanted to read. I wanted it to be a narrative. Uh, and essentially, I mean, what my career has been about has been to sort of show the connection. Um, between what happens with money and what happens on the field. 
Um, I don't write that much about the Giants signing up some new sponsor, but what I will write about is you know how that money filters down and affects the competition. And you know, as I looked at this topic, um, that was really what I was focused on. And it starts with a guy named Mark McCormick, really, who created IMG. And I mean, people I think look at Mark McCormick as someone who figured out how to make a lot of money. And that's not really where it started with McCormick. Yeah, he wanted to make a lot of money, but what made, what, but his genius was to really understand how to improve the system, to look at sports and say this is not. These, not these athletes aren't getting paid enough, it's that this whole entity is completely undervalued and it's underserved by it. So his idea of getting the people he represented, starting with Arnold Palmer, more money, wasn't so much to just make him rich and secure, um, though that was part of it. It was to give him more time to train and more time to practice and to get better and to make, and to make it so that you would spark competition so everybody would get better. And then when that would happen, the television product, which was first coming into vogue in the 60s, really, in terms of sports television, that would be a better thing to watch because the competition would be better, the players would be better, um, it would be more attractive. And as that got more valuable, people would watch it more, people would pay more for it, and then the money would circle, circle back to the athletes, and people would then look at those careers and say, wow, those are really lucrative careers. I actually wanna be a tennis player because I could make a lot of money being a tennis player, and that would stoke competition at the, the lower levels. And that's really what happened as you went and started in the individual sports like golf and tennis because you didn't have as many sort of entrenched interests trying to hold people back because um, as we all know, the, the best way to control power is to control finances and to keep the people that are under you essentially as poor as possible. <laughs> if you can control them financially, you can probably control them in every other way possible. And that's essentially what was happening in sports. But there was this athlete empowerment movement that started, like I said, in the individual sports, and then it spread to baseball, and it spread to the Olympics. And in every case, you know, what happened as these athletes got empowered is the sports boomed. Um, we're in a weird place in this country uh, where corporations sort of believe that the best way to have a successful business is to pay their workers as little as possible. Um, and what's so interesting is that's, that's completely untrue. Uh, you know, the, the, the great, great German manufacturing companies, I mean, their factory workers are paid more than anybody in the world, and they produce the best products. And, uh, you know, the correlation here is with baseball. For years, baseball owners, they decried free agency. It, it was wrecking everything. It completely ruined the sport. I mean, free agency and the influx of money in baseball in the 1970s, that's what caused baseball to boom. I mean, all of a sudden, baseball is a year-round sport. All of these sports, they become year-round sports. You have to follow them. You have to follow the moves. There's more attention. Uh, there's, so there's more eyeballs. People are interested in it more. And essentially, you know, that's the media boom that leads to everything. But it starts with really taking the athletes and moving them from what was the bottom of the pyramid in sports um, to the top of the pyramid. And Pat, this has benefited your clients, correct? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. A hundred percent. I mean, you know, the empowering of the individual, you know, you now have guys that are, you know, generating uh, on the highest level enough revenue to give themselves freedom of what they want to do. I mean, the idea yeah, of... You know what they want to do is they want to go to the gym more. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. the thing. I mean, the, 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 so most of these athletes, you, you know, you get a great job. You know what you want to do? You want to keep your great job. Yeah, yeah. So you want to play as long as possible. Right. And so what are you going to do? You're going to go work out more and train more. And unfortunately, some of them you might take drugs that aren't very good for you and aren't allowed, actually. That's a bad thing. But you know, when the better angels prevail, um, they're working harder and they make the product better. I mean, turn on an NFL game from 30 years ago. It's pretty hard to watch. It's really slow. Um, the, guy, the, the guys are not particularly athletic. It's completely different from what 
people, what these networks and media companies pay five billion dollars a year now, and the reason is is because you know people can't take their eyes off it. Absolutely. Um, we have the Olympics coming up in Rio this this summer, and I just want to spend a couple of minutes talking about that because that's a tremendous marketing and public relations challenge. How should how should they be approaching it? And and Jessica, NBC has a ton of money tied up in this mm -hmm. and if you were advising them today with your expertise on marketing and promotion <laughs> and so on I mean uh, these, these are some serious issues right yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't think I'd be advising them on the Olympics per se yeah. uh, but yeah, yeah. Uh, but I was just at a conference in New York the leaders conference and they had an entire panel around uh, sponsors who sponsor both the NFL but are also major major Olympic sponsors mm -hmm. and it was a pretty similar tone they they have their worries but they said they have their worries about every Olympics game there's always mm -hmm. issues there's always threats uh, there's always challenges uh, there's also a challenge on them internally they use these sponsorships to grow their businesses and to af affect bottom line sales uh, I'd say their excitement level, their energy level, is also matched by those challenges. Uh, but they were all pretty optimistic. And it was fascinating to hear it, some of the challenges I think I perceived versus what they perceived. So here I am listening to the women's soccer team talk about the Zika virus. I'm, talking, I'm listening to other people on stage talking about security or economic or some of the, uh, I'll say, grander scheme threats. But I don't think I'd be in a place to advise them. But th there's major money. I mean, it's major money spent on those sponsorships and those activations. The sports industry continues to flourish thanks to the extensive use of marketing techniques. Thanks to our panelists and special thanks to Dave Kaplan, director of the Yogi Berra Museum and Learning Center, for co-sponsoring the panel. For more information on this or any edition of Carpe Diem, contact us at carpediem at mail.montclair.edu or call 973-655-5158. I'm Mark Rosenwig. For all of us at Montclair State University, thanks for watching Carpe Diem.